My name is Wen Tran, and I'm going to take off this, uh, this uh, my one of my many infamous signs. It's really hard to work with this, but you can, if you if you get really bored with me, you can always just look at it and laugh at that, and it gives you better entertainment than I do sometimes. So, um, if you don't know anything about me, the short version before we get into the long version is I am the co-founder of Starry Kitchen. Um, I also call myself the chief instigating officer and social media whore of Starry Kitchen. Three years ago, my wife and I started an illegal and underground restaurant in the back of my apartment. It eventually became the number one Ace restaurant listing in all a great loss status on Yelp. And it was a fucking fluke. And we have no idea how it worked out. We ended up running, opening a restaurant two years ago downtown. And for some reason, my obnoxious kind of uh, funny antics still get us pressed. We've been in like the New York Times, LA Times, Food and Wine Magazine, NPR, New Yorker, some other bullshit like that. But if you don't like my food, I always tell people, who gives a shit? So but anyway. <laughs> With that, let's get started. Um, the title of my presentation is Everything I Learned in Life, I Learned by Fucking Shit Up. <laughs> by the way, I, I, I did put in parentheses the SH because sometimes I'm not fucking shit up as much as I'm fucking it up. That just happens. <laughs> so I'm just gonna tell you I'm not, I obviously am not, don't look like a perfect person, I'm not, so. Um, but before I talk too much about me and us, and this is my wife, the chef, and you know, whiskers and me and Antonio Vieira go. So that's a different story. This, this sign and that picture have a lot to do in common. He enjoyed my balls in his mouth, but I'll tell you about that later. Um, he's the one that told me that though, by the way, that's not me. So um, I wanted to give a big shout out to, and you know, this, well, I consider this year's MVP of fucking shit up goes to Mark Zuckerberg. That guy's gonna make a shitload of money today. Can you believe that? He's probably already making a whole lot. Well, the evaluation's a hundred billion dollars. Oh, oh. <laughs> I, I don't even have five bucks in my pocket, so I wish I, I wish I had one billion dollars. That'd be amazing. So, but anyway, now back to me and my life of contradiction. And I actually have little notes here, so I'm gonna look. I'm gonna stand right here. Um, I actually did grow up in Texas. It may not sound like it. So I'm Vietnamese. I was born in Virginia. I moved to Texas when I was six months old. My parents moved me. I couldn't physically move myself. But and I actually grew up there all my life. But you know. Texas and Dallas, actually where I'm from originally, is everything, basically everything I learned there and everything I did there made me who I am. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in computer science. Uh, I have 600 video games at home. I watch independent films. I'm good at math. I was pre-med. I took the MCAT. I'm kind of one of those guys that's just all over the place. If you haven't figured that out in the last five minutes. And uh, let's see, I studied piano for 13 years. And uh, oh yeah, the main thing was, if, if this helps you kind of pave the path of how I started into what I am now. When I was 21 years old, I was actually being sued by the state of Texas for libel and defamation with my one friend for, for starting something. You know what? Everyone, everyone here knows Yelp, right? You know Yelp? Well, we, when I was 21, it was about 1999, we were trying to do a teacher evaluation like website because, you know, I wanted to warn people before they signed up for a teacher in college, like who the shitty ones were and who the great ones were. And they literally were suing us. And we would go into an office we would go and actually we'd go into a conference room and then all of a sudden they bring up a screen with 10 lawyers and they're like, we're suing you. I was like, what are you gonna sue us for, money? I don't know money, I'm a fucking college student. <laughs> so that kind of started everything in terms of my path of like fucking shit up. Um, my other, my other like, motto is, is like, I celebrate my failure too. So fuck shit up, celebrate your failure. They kind of go back and forth. I'm kind of bipolar that way. So. Um, so in the end, so in college, fucking up and fucking shit up was fun. This actually, this kid right here is my, this, this guy you can see on the left, this guy is pretty much my inspiration for almost everything I've done in the last 20 years. His name is Mo Kashmiri, also known as Mo Butts. We were, one, we were being sued together in college. He went off to go to law school at Berkeley. He ended up one-upping me because he sued the entire state of California. Whenever, whenever the, all that stuff was going on with Gray Davis and everything else, he, um, he, they were raising all the tuition and actually, one year they raised tuition in the middle of the semester. So imagine you paid tuition and they raised it and said you had to pay it. He's the, one, he's the guy that found the clause that said they would never do that and sue the state of California. 
Henny won. It's $40 million injunction. Of course, they raised the rates again next year because they couldn't afford the $40 million injunction. But so that's my partner in crime. And we used to protest together. And he's still, like, he's still a rebel rouser. He's still, like, he does union protests up in the north. And you know, that's, that's what I'm all about. So, well, shit, more history before we get to the good stuff. This is my wife. She's wearing, she is wearing the Yoda outfit. She's our you know, Jedi master of food. Um, you know, real quick, I, like I said, I'm all over the place. After, after college, I became a dot-commer, raised $200 million in amateur capital. I used to pitch six days a week, five times a day. Um, that was before the bubble burst. Um, I met my wife who rejected me for three months straight, and I couldn't take no for an answer because I was, I was so enamored with this woman that would never say yes to me. So. Um, and then I gave up and she caved in. So. And then the bubble burst. That's not a bubble, though. That's more of an explosion, right? Um, then I started swimming with the sharks. I actually worked in Hollywood. I actually used to work at William Morris, if anyone knows that place. Um, I used to get scripts thrown at me, yell at me all the time, shoes thrown at me. I meet stars, blah, 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 blah. I worked in film for like 10 years, actually. Um, I used to go to Cannes, Toronto, Sundance, selling films. Now I sell Bandami sandwiches. Um, after that, uh, we fast forward to January 2009. This is where my wife is pivotal. Um, she is not... Uh, she's, she's not classically trained at all. Um, my wife, it helps you kind of give kind of perspective. In college, while we were all making instant ramen and other things, she's, uh, she's Chinese born in um, Vietnam. She would make a dish called bun riu, which is like a ground pork, ground crab, lobster, tomato-based noodle dish. That would be what stuff she would make when she was 18 years old because she missed that kind of food. And she would make that all the time. And she would do like crawfish boils and other stuff because, you know, we're from Texas and we love us some crawfish. So. Um, and so fast forward to January 2009, we, my wife, you know, we've been together for about seven years at that point in time, and she used to cook Chinese and Vietnamese food. I literally just asked her one day, could you make something else? And she told me to shut the fuck up. And then <laughs> the next day, she started making Korean food and all this other stuff. And what happened was this catalyst, she started making all these original dishes for four months, taking pictures of them and posting them up on Facebook. And now, She's not a designer, she's not a blogger, she's not any of that. She's not as methodical as some of us are with our pictures or as Asian as we are with the food pictures and other things. Um, and, but, and, that, and that leads me to this. She kind of taught me, I'm a social media whore, but she taught me, and this is more of the more recent food porn, but her doing that, I started watching the evolution four months of just everyone like, oh my God, what the fuck? Why aren't you making this for us? Blah, 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 blah. It, it was just astounding. So fast forward four months after that in April, my wife got laid off from her job in advertising. And, and it was kind of phenomenal because it is the catalyst of what started Starry Kitchen too. So she does what any good Facebook user does. She posts it up on the internet, right? So I just got laid off with the rest of my friends. Time to look. Anyone interested in the project manager, traffic manager for an advertising agency? Very self-motivated and very detailed oriented and organized. She got 24 comments. All of them would say, cook, 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 cook. Why don't you open up a taco truck because the Kogi you know, truck was going on at the time? And my wife was like, well, why the fuck do I want to cook? I was like, honey, because everyone in your fucking world can see that you love cooking except for you. So at that point in time, she was unemployed. And she's like, you know, we tried Kogi. And I liked it. And my wife is pretty Asian. If you guys don't know anyone that's Cantonese or Vietnamese, they always think they can make it better. They always do. It's like, what? this is bullshit. I'm paying $2. This is too much. I can make this better. And her idea, her idea was a Vietnamese taco. And she started just playing with it. And I was like, fuck it, you're unemployed. Do whatever you want. So for three weeks, we started playing with food. And she started with Vietnamese and Taiwanese and, and other things. And you know, what I didn't mention is that my wife, while growing up in America, she was, she was born in Vietnam, moved to Anaheim when she was one year old. And then she moved to Texas. She grew up in America, but she grew up Asian. She watched, if anyone's Cantonese, she grew up, grew up watching TV, Asian television all her life. She has no idea what ALF is. She has no, no idea who Scott Bayo is. Good for her, because you know, I didn't want to get knocked up by that guy. But uh, uh, <laughs> is it the mustache? Still? Um, so at the end of the day, she inadvertently made herself the master of Asian food. Because like, when we go out to eat on the weekends and when I worked in Hollywood, she was like, I would be like, honey, what do you want to eat this weekend? I'm like, I don't give a shit as long as it's Asian. And, that, and we've been together for 10 years now, so imagine we've been eating like different Asian meals 10 years in a row and her cooking us eating. So that's what led to this. So we, we played around with food for three weeks, and then at a certain point in time on a Thursday night, this is what this phrase comes into play, thinking is overrated. Um, Thursday night, that Thursday night, I was like, fuck it. We're going to serve out of the back of our apartment this Sunday. 
It's like, are you fucking crazy? Are you kidding? What about the health department? Like, who gives a shit? Don't worry about it. I'll figure it out. <laughs> and that night, I asked her to come up with the, the name, and she, Kate, she, she, her favorite cooking show on TVB, or that Chinese like, cooking channel, is, is called Starry Kitchen. And that is the inception of the name. It's not that thought out. My wife, in general, when she does something, doesn't put so much thought into something. She just goes with her gut and goes with it. Because I had told her too, I was like, I don't know what this is that we're going to start, but if it works, we're going to be stuck with it. So Thursday night, she agreed to it. I kind of coerced her into it. I didn't actually really convince her. She wasn't really totally into it. Um, Saturday night, I printed up 300 flyers, flyered every single fucking apartment in my complex. I lived in these corporate com apartment complexes down in North Hollywood. And with my dog, and he actually pooped in front of one of them, but don't, don't tell that person, because I kind of cleaned it up. But, uh, and then that Sunday, I set up just like a lemonade stand. I put, like a, I put a table. We have a communal patio. This is a picture from the communal patio. And I just sat there and waited. And I Facebooked everyone and tweeted everyone. And uh, that was the beginning of Star Kitchen, AKA the illegal underground. Oh, stuff is fun too, so. Um, and this is a picture, by the way. When we started getting into it, because we ran it for about seven months, um, we, the first time we got like 20 people, the last time we did it, I had 130 people come to my apartment span three hours. And by the way, my apartment is the, is the ground floor, but my ground floor is the second floor. You cannot fucking find me if you just walk up to my building. And the last thing is, at that point in time, the health department already found me, so we actually got found by the health department because we were that popular. Um, I didn't give a shit. I actually took black ops, and I took it inside the apartment. And then, so I was password only, too. And by the way, I'm Asian. No one wears their fucking shoes in my fucking apartment. So there were like hundreds of shoes outside of the apartment. So the natural question, I'm sure some of you may be thinking this, the natural question everyone asks is, well, what about your neighbors? What about them? They didn't give a shit. They were there. So who cares? Because most of them were mid-20-something like kids that were like trying to be actors. And they didn't know how to cook anyway. And we asked for a $5 donation. So they wouldn't mind rolling out of bed paying $5, rolling back into bed. Like, they didn't have to go down the street to McDonald's. They could go to my apartment and get some food, so. Um, now, the interesting with, thing with that, too, was Yelp discovered me. So as I t mentioned to you guys, you know, my apartment eventually, and I didn't orchestrate this. I, I, I'm kind of smart, but I don't think of everything. My apartment at one point in time, and I don't have all the screen captures because I lost some of them, my apartment ended up actually becoming the number one HP's restaurant in all of Los Angeles, like I mentioned to you guys. <laughs> But by the way, number two, Michelin star rated Urasawa. And by the way, I, I say that mainly because, not because our food was that good. I didn't give a shit, because I think we were having a lot of fun. And we were doing something illegal and underground. It was really fun for people, too. And it's strange, because I, how the fuck do we get on Yelp? I don't know. So we had a five star rating on Yelp, too. So, and we still do, by the way. It's, it says closed, though. So. Um, so Yelp even called me, and they were like, what the fuck are you? Are you actually out of your apartment? I'm like, yes. And they're like, that is amazing. So internally in Yelp, they started supporting me too. Um, so as I say, most restaurateurs despise Yelp. I don't. So. Um, now, and we'll get to this in a second. So after the seven months, I, my friends ended up opening a sushi restaurant downtown. Actually, at the beginning. They opened the sushi restaurant downtown, and I told them what I was doing. They're like, oh, that's cute, whatever. And three months later, they called me. They're like, you know what? Your apartment is getting more traction and press than my actual restaurant. Um, we have no idea what we're doing. Do you think you want to take Sorry Kitchen to the next level? And I was like, sure. And so we ended up negotiating. And even when the health department found me, this is the fun thing, too. When the health department found me, they actually, you know, I opened the door, and they're like, health department, like, come on in. And they're like, you don't want us in there? I'm like, no, it's a dinner party. You're welcome. Please, come on in. Um, and that was fun, because my wife was like this. She was fuming. She was so fucking mad the health department found us. And, and I was just talking, like, hey, would, would you like something to eat? Would you like something to drink? And you know, if you guys are wondering about that, um, the biggest distinction um, that, or how I got out of it or weaseled my, my way out of it was it was a dinner party that people just happened to donate money to. And, but the thing that people don't know when it comes to um, something that's donation-based, and something I actually learned when protesting with my friend Mo a long time ago, we were protesting the U UC Regents, and they were starting to sell t-shirts. And uh, all of a sudden, the cops were going to bust us. But then when they were like, it's for a donation, they kind of got really mad and walked away. And, but in a donation, you cannot refuse anyone. So you have to give it to someone without the exchange of money, regardless. 
So what I did was, like, I would stand right here and the donation box would be over there. I wouldn't even touch the fucking money. So, and they were not very happy with that. And they sat there for half an hour and they're telling me I was like the bacon wrapped hot dog ladies and I was about to bitch them out about that, but I closed my mouth anyway. And they were like, look, if you don't get another call, we won't come out. And I was like, well, why don't you use me? Like, what do you mean? Like, I could be your poster child because I'm already in the process of taking over a real restaurant with real licenses, with real permits and real shitty pay and other things. They're like, well, we don't care. It's like, well, you should. So fast forward two or three months after that, I ended up taking over the space downtown it's at Bunker Hill. You can look at the cards if you want to see the address. Um, and we opened up Star Kitchen completely under the radar. But I did it my way. So my I have a lot of mottos and rules, and one of them is, if I'm going to fucking fail, I'm going to fail my own fucking terms. Because at the end of the day, running a restaurant, I can confirm you know, with all you guys after two and a half years, it is really, really, really fucking hard. I work in film. I work in independent film. I worked in independent Asian American film, which is, which is a, even a smaller niche. I can tell you right now, I did not make a lot of money, but I am one of those kind of guys that I kind of am driven more by passion than I am by money, which is really weird because when I was younger, I wanted to make a whole lot of money, then I was broke and that's it. Um, so in doing the Story Kitchen, I had to do it my way. And so one of the things that, you know, John and uh, Joe had noticed too, is that my menu, this is kind of, this is kind of a good example of how we do things. So, Yes, the menu is supposed to be confusing. So we may live in LA and no one wants to talk to each other. I don't give a shit. I like to talk to people. I like to engage with people. You know, we're only human. Plus I'm from the South, you know, I like to greet people. So a lot of times people walk in and you know, this is actually from the, from the register to the door, it's about as far as that glass. And people will literally walk in that far and I'm like, hey, how are, you, how are you doing? And they're like, oh, you know, don't worry, I got it. I'm like, no, no you don't. I'm the owner, I designed it that way. And they, they look at me, but what happens is, is that I end up bringing them in and end up having a, a conversation, not to sell them on it, because I don't believe in truly selling someone, because it comes to food or any kind of you know, decision making, you always want it to be your idea. And I just want to explain to them what it's about. And in doing that, if you want to speak from a business perspective, my rate of conversion is a lot higher, because I end up connecting with them, They're like, well shit, this guy took the time to explain it to me, I may as well buy into it. And part of that thought process too is, I don't care what you guys think, Asian food is not as popular as you think it is. Teriyaki, sushi, takeout Chinese, that's not Asian food. I think teriyaki is as American as ketchup is. Sushi is not Asian food, that's one segment of one country. Because um, people used to be like, I eat Asian food, I eat sushi. Like, no, they don't have sushi in like Cambodia, what are you talking about? Um, and, you know, there's a lot of hurdles to getting people to eat Asian food. Like, I don't have pictures of food. And by the way, do you guys go to a $50 Italian restaurants and ask for fucking pictures of spaghetti? I'm going to do that next time, by the way. I want to see what they do. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but, that, but that, that's what it is. It's like I wanted to build a culture, if, that, if I can articulate it any better way. Like, the idea that you know, you'd buy into it, you would you know, trust me. And you know, that, this will help, too. Like, another thing that you guys don't know, so the concept, I'll take a step back. So we serve Pan-Asian comfort food. Malaysian, Indonesian, Vietnamese, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, wherever the fuck we feel like making. You know, it was a wrap, a banh mi sandwich, rice or salad. That's simple. The hard part, if anyone ever decides to come back after the first time they come, is that we rotate the menu every week, every Monday. And so people, for most people, that breaks the routine. What people, like, oh my God, you're fucking, like, you're screwing up my world. Right? I can't come to that one thing. But the routine that I found out of the apartment, because one thing I didn't mention out of the apartment is, we only serve one dish at a time. And we changed it every week. We never served the same dish twice, if not for a while, maybe for three months. The routine I found was not necessarily people would go for that one dish, but people would just trust us. I got people coming from Orange County to New York, San Francisco, to my apartment. I was like, fuck, what if it isn't good? I was like, well, we trust you. I was like, man, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's a lot of layers to what we do. I only have like another 10 minutes to talk to you guys. I'm not gonna ramble too much about that. You can come talk to me afterwards or come to the restaurant and I'll ramble your ear off too. Um, I will say, and that leads to the next slide, is that I am also methodically reckless. I'm also an extrovert introvert. I'm a very big fan of contradiction. I don't think you have to go one way or the other. You can be a combination of both. Like I said, I have 600 video games, but I like to party. Um, I, I, I do. I have, by the way, when I have 600 video games, I really mean it. Like I have, like, if anyone's a game nerd, I have like a Neo Geo, Neo Geo Pocket, Dreamcast, Hero Duo. Um, I have like Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color, DS, DSi. Uh, you know, my Nintendo, almost all my stuff in my original boxes. 
Like, I am a nerd. Like, if anyone, does anyone, does anyone here playing Diablo 3? No one wants to oh my god, that's amazing. <laughs> that's good. Because I, I hate those people playing it right now because I really want to fucking play that right now. So rather than be here, no, that's not, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. So, but in everything I do, I do think about, about everything I say, the rhythm, the, the reaction. Like, you know, someone with the menu, someone, a lot of people will tell me, oh, why don't you make it easier? Well, if I make it easier, people will, more people will walk out than walk in. And, but the, the, the important thing to understand about that is that, yeah, that's contradictory to maybe logic, but for me, like, I had at least the passion and the vision to execute it, and that was the difference. Because I would literally be in front taking orders from every fucking person. Our line used to be like 40 or 50 deep, and people were like, you're the owner? Like, yeah, it's like, why are you out here? It's like, because I want to meet everyone. And that's what I did for, and I still do it every now and then, but for the first two years, I was out taking every order, getting to know everyone. I knew when people had haircuts, I knew when people like, had nice dresses, they got pregnant, and like, how are you like that? And if it helps you, my biggest fear in life was being forgotten, is why I'm wearing a mustache and a Commodore head. <laughs> and I'm not kidding either, I was a really shy kid. I was a really shy kid, and then I turned five, and then I got in trouble a lot. So, for talking, talking. They used to call me Motormouth when I was in elementary school. Um, but anyway, uh, but I'm going to kind of move on to like, you know, kind of the, the, probably the core of how I grew our business was truly social media. And you know, you guys might think I'm kidding, but I do call myself the social media whore, and I'm proud of it, and I share almost everything, as much as I can. You know, and that started when we were at our apartment. I just started sharing every aspect of what we did. Again, contradicting to a restaurateur. Like, I would share like, all the food that we were eating, and they're like, well, why would you want to promote another restaurant? It's like, because number one, they're fucking great. Number two, I think it kind of defines the taste that I have. When people think that they may have the same taste as me, they're like, oh, I, I, I want to go there. And I actually literally have people that follow me on Instagram and Foursquare that have not been to the restaurant before or heard about it, but they follow me there and they show, they show up because of that. They go, man, you have, you have a crazy fucking appetite. It's like, I just want to come eat your food and I don't even know who you are. So, um, and you know, it's not even all that. I even blog every day too. So I blog every day, I post um, on Facebook, Twitter, and by the way, the messaging is different for all of them. I'm very cognizant of that, so I'm very specific about what I say in each one. And uh, everything from, you know, I like unicorns to this fucking sandwich is good, you know? So um, that makes us who we are. Oh, that's the picture. So that's Antonio Vieira goes to the mayor. That's one of his many girlfriends after he broke up <laughs> with his wife. He does not like tofu, and then she took, this is at the LA Street Food Fest two years ago, and my, a lot of people have been asking me, my most infamous outfit, I have 15 different ones, is my banana suit. The same one that I'm doing, the three-way grilled cheese eating thing, so I'm proud of that too. It may be kind of homosexual, but, you know, but I, I, I like those guys. My wife wouldn't probably appreciate that exactly, but. Um, so Antonio Villaragosa tried my balls and he enjoyed them, and so three months later, I saw him at a press conference, and then he was like, oh my god. I remember you. And I was playing clothes. I'm like, what, what, what? He's like, I enjoyed your balls in my mouth. <laughs> and, but no, but you have to understand too, I'm playing clothes. He's single. I'm being at me. He had all these sex scandals. I was like, hey, dude, I'm being at me. No sucky sucky, okay? You don't want to do that. And his assistants, his assistants were like, what, what are you saying? So, and by the way, I shared that too. And he actually, he tweeted that. He tweeted it as well. So, you know, maybe I helped him become a social media whore as well. So. Um, you know, it, it's, it's I, I don't know, I'm, I'm fascinated with it, not necessarily as a business person, I'm fascinated with it just because I like to Facebook stalk everyone, and as an extension of my restaurant, it also extends the culture of my humor and what we like and what we do, and that's the only reason why we do it. And if anyone wants, you know, advice on social media, I'd say just do it because you want to, not because you have to. There are plenty of businesses that run without it. Who gives a shit if you don't understand it? If you do, then it's fun, you know, so it's like a game, so. Um, Real quick before I have to wrap this up, this is why I don't have enough time to talk about everything. Um, if you haven't heard either, so I've, a little anecdote, I did host two illegal underground weed dinners about a month ago. Um, let's just say that I'm not, you know, I've used recreational substances before. I don't really give a shit. My drug ultimately is, are these illegal underground kind of like gatherings. I don't know why, it's just I get a super high from it. And by the way, the second we dinner was the stre most stressful fucking thing I've ever done in my fucking life. So the first one was 30 people. Some people in this room have actually been to the first one. I handpicked every single person to be at this dinner, and we served about nine courses, half Chinese herbs, half weed, and basically the motto of it was take things that taste shitty and make them taste good. And, and after we you know, finished serving, we kicked them out because we didn't want to see them high anyway. So, 
Um, the second time, I wanted to one-up myself. I, we invited, actually, we opened up to 100 people, of no one I picked, in a secret location in downtown. And this is actually the outfit I wore. I was, you know, my, this is one of my alter egos. I'm Commodore Booty McHooters. Booty McHooters, that's just in case you were wondering what I was saying. Um, and the, the story of it, oh, I have it right here. So my story was, you know, this, this, they were under the guise that it was the We Love Lionel Richie listening tour. That was the story. Now, if people wanted to stay for the dinner, that was great. And we actually almost, all, almost got busted that night, too. I had this bike cop bust me because we had everyone meet at a secret location. Like, and they're like, oh, you're on private property. Like, who are you with? I'm like, I'm with the Lionel Richie listening tour, of course. <laughs> and then, no, but here's the funny thing. Like, I just did that. And he, and he calls it in. He's like, it's only the Lionel Richie listening tour. Over. It's all right. <laughs> and there, there's a line of 40 people, right? 40 people are like, that guy just bought that. Oh my God, and he rode off. So, I mean, if anything, to kind of wrap it up, like, I, I don't play by the rules, and I don't think necessarily the rules are necessarily meant to be broken as much as it's just who I am and I like to do it. And, then, and by the way, I do everything, everything I do, I do it first because it's fun, not because it's a great business opportunity or anything like that, because at the end of the day, if I can't put the energy to do it, I don't fucking do it. You know, doing this kind of stuff, like I was telling someone else, I wear the banana suit. I've worn it for 12 hours straight in Hawaii before. I'm gonna take this off now, so. Um, I do it because I love to, not because I have to. And, and opening a restaurant, considering how, how fucking, you know, just stressful it is, I do it because I really love food and I really love people. And it's my drug. And uh, I, it's, I can't explain it any other way than that. It's as simple as that. I love meeting everyone, I love hearing stories. Like, I love the most inane things. Like, I met a chick that her father makes that foam that makes steel or something like that, and I had a half an hour conversation with her about that. She's like, this is the longest conversation I've ever had about this. It's like, it's fascinating. <laughs> and that's why I do it. And whether we succeed or not in growing this business, I can at least say that I did it my way, and that is the biggest thing that I want to accomplish, because I don't want to be sitting on the couch and this fails, and like, you know what? I could have, should have worn that banana suit. I could have, should have worn that mustache. And it wouldn't make sense anyway if I did that and sitting down, but now it does, kind of. So um, I think I got to wrap it up. If anyone has any questions for me, I think we're doing Q&A. Thank you so much, by the way. So. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. And by the way, my name is Wynn Tran, and I endorse this presentation with love. So. <laughs> We just open it up. Does anyone have any questions? Right here. I mean, well, so what do you, you said that if you succeed and continue to grow this business, what, do you, what are your next steps? What do you want to do? So he's asking if, if, if I succeed in this business, what do I want to do to grow this? I've actually, I hate it when you can't hear the questions when you do these things, right? Um, well, there's kind of four things. One is, so what we do in, in the restaurant business, I'm in the fast casual space, and basically we make really fresh food but make it look fast. Um, I want to grow that partially because, and I actually have a friend that's moving on to them. I consider Chipotle my, my number one competitor. She already knows this though, so. Because um, they're actually opening up, they've already opened up a Southeast Asian concept in uh, Washington, D.C. called Shop House. And, I, and I, I say that in a friendly sense. I, I'm a firm believer in friendly competition. If, if Chipotle's going to invest millions of dollars in a space that I'm already in, why did, wouldn't I try to grow that? And why wouldn't I want to try to squeeze them out of L.A. if they try to get in here, so. Um, but outside of that, I'm not quite sure. And I will tell you like the truth, my wife, when it comes to cooking food, she's not as motivated by the fast casual stuff anymore because we have literally 100 plus like items we can just rotate in and out when we feel like. She's now like kind of moved on in terms of like mentally and like maybe bar food or more sit down stuff, but not in a pretentious way. I'm not a big fan of like tablecloth and all that kind of stuff for me. Like I like to eat that kind of stuff, but I'm a big fan of sharing food with everyone. Like you can walk out of my place for under $10 for almost everything we make. And I'm a big believer in And we do make everything. We chop, slice, dice, marinate, pickle, make a lot of marinade sauces and dressings. But I, don't want to, I want to remove that layer for people to say, well, I couldn't afford it, or something similar, or like it was too expensive, to at least try the food. And that, that's another layer I consider in, like weird Asian food. And like, at least, like, oh, I'll give it a shot and see if it's any good. So um, other than that, I might, I don't know if I should tell you. <laughs> I might do like a, an underground pho, pho concept too. So. Any other questions? Right here? How do we, how do we sign up for the underground stuff? Oh, how, how do we sign up for the underground stuff? That's harder. I, gotta, I, have to change, I have to change the structure on that. I used to have an email list. 
um, and might still be emails. Because um, you know, when you're on Twitter, it's not really very private because everyone can follow me. And actually, by the way, when the health department found me, true story, the one thing they caught me on is they printed up my entire Twitter stream. <laughs> I was actually, I was really impressed with that. I was like, you guys are getting smart. It's good. <laughs> and they, because like, it was like, were you serving dinner? I'm like, no, I'm not. Well, it says it here on your Twitter feed. I'm like, oh, I'm just being funny, you know? So I, in terms of the legal stuff, I, 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 I am kind of a press whore, so one of the things I do sometimes is I push it out to the press a lot. Um, for the more legal stuff, I probably won't, probably more hush-hush. Um, I don't know, you kind of just have to follow me on Twitter and Facebook and see if I'm hinting at anything. Um, I don't know, I have, to, I have to figure out, I gotta figure out something that's kind of fun. That, it might just be back to the email list, so. A code word? <laughs> I know, the code word. I, my, 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 my new favorite code word right now is Fruit Loops, so. Because I love Fruit Loops, so. Yes? Mm -hmm. How do you distinguish what works best for each forum? Um, so the question is, so I, I have a different voice for everything I do, the blog, Facebook, and Twitter, and how I distinguish it. Um, well, let me say this, and I, th I think I'm feeding my ego when I'm saying this. Everything I do, I do it just for me alone. Like, I'm not initially trying to entertain everyone as much as I'm entertaining myself, because, you know, why would I put it out there just for like, oh, I had a crazy thought. Um, in terms of distinguishing it, it was just, doing it enough and seeing what people reacted to and what they didn't and what was annoying them, because I'm pretty annoying sometimes. Like, I'll give you an example. Facebook, you cannot update. Like, I used to update every hour, if not every half hour. That's too much. It just floods people's news feed, and they hate that. And people started telling me that, and I started watching my numbers drop, too, and people just unsubscribe. On Twitter, they kind of like that a lot more. So, and the thing is, my Facebook and Twitter are linked. So if I, if I add to Facebook, if I post something on Facebook, it'll go to Twitter immediately. But sometimes I'll just go to Twitter. And that'll be more inane thoughts. Like today, we were driving by this uh, billboard and my wife saw the Care Bear sign. And she's like, what's a Care Bear stare? And just started going like this. <laughs> it's like, what is that? It's like, it's like what, is that what they do when they stare? I'm like, yeah, it's like, that's so gay. I'm like, no, it's really masculine. You don't even know. <laughs> and like, what are they shooting? Like, they're shooting out love, right? They're drowning people out. Does anyone know the Care Bear stare? Stare! But, and, but with the blog, with the blog is really interesting too. So the blog, more than anything, I have no idea. Like outside, I know how many people hit it and all that, but the blog ended up being one of the biggest drivers of all three. I had people come in, and I'm really, like I just, I can write a really long post or a short one. It's kind of very uh, free flowing the way I write it. And I don't necessarily talk about my food all day long, because how much do you want to really talk about my food and listen to that? You know, and I'll put like, you know, I don't know, Bill Bib DeVoe videos that love me some poison and everything else. But. Uh, and that ended up becoming the biggest driver, and that probably may be the biggest driver of the culture, because it's, it's, it's really all, all over the place, and it's one place that's probably the most static of anything else, because if you're going to a blog, so here's a great example, when you're going to a blog, you're actively pursuing it, right? When you're on Facebook, you're not necessarily, it might be in your news feed, you might have liked someone, but you don't really visit the site. And on Twitter, you're just, whenever you're checking in. And no one, I don't think people check in as much as I do or some other people, so you have to really hit them, hit your mark as you're doing it, and just have fun with it. I just, and you know, I, I don't lastly message about deals and all that so much, because I'm not as interested in that. I try to, but it doesn't, I don't find as much traction with it, so. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. Yes? Tumblr, because I hear that Tumblr sort of kind of links them all together. What do you think about that? Uh, what about Tumblr? Well, my website is a Tumblr site, number one. Um, and by the way, this is, this is interesting. So when I started out of my apartment, one thing I was very conscious about was trying to do everything on the cheap. You know, I know a lot of people use WordPress and everything, and it's great. I went to Tumblr for two reasons. One, I loved it stylistically, because you know, the community. Number two, it was the cheapest of everything. Because in order to assign a domain, so you can buy a domain and assign it, it, it didn't cost anything, you just had to know how to do the code. And they host everything. Like images and like that, they'll host everything. And I pay nothing for Tumblr. Um, as a community, it's great. I don't actually, I think I'm contradictory to the community of, of just pure imagery, because most of it's pure imagery and less blogging. I'm more about blogging and just incessant talking than anything else. But I really do like it, because it, it, it's like, it has a social media aspect, because you can have followers. And you know, I really like that, because I see people that have followed me, and they, you know, it grows, and they like things and other things, too. But um, I don't know, it's, it's fun. And people follow you, and you don't have to worry about, it's not always, it's not just all a free-for-all in terms of how many people hit your website, too. So. Any other questions? Am I that boring? Do you want to give the location of your 
Oh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll endorse my restaurant. So if you guys don't know where we're at, we're on top of Bunker Hill, which is basically uh, next to the Disney Concert on the Mocha on Grand Avenue. We're in this place called California Plaza. It's a little bit hard to find. You will not find it just by driving by because we're in the little food court. Um, here's my motto for the restaurant, too, if you're just considering it. Um, come for the validation, stay for the food. Because if you don't like the food, <laughs> at least you don't have to pay 40 bucks for parking. Right? And if we do, we validate parking for lunch and dinner. So, uh, and, but the parking is even harder. Our, our, our address is Grand Avenue. Our parking is on Olive. But on Olive, it says Grand Avenue. So it says on the bottom of the card, it actually says where the parking lot is. Um, it's, it's on Olive between 2nd and 4th. And we, we validate for both parking lots. What sort of changes and compromises do I have to make when I change from the legal underground apartment to the fast casual? In terms of food, you know what is mass producing food, um, especially for lunch, there's a certain time restriction and people want it in a certain speed. So I'd say we had to cut back on the things that maybe, in terms of cer certain like preparation or flavors that wouldn't work in a very quick manner. Um, I'll give you an example, like we used to do our own calbee, like Korean short ribs, but we make our own marinade. It's like a soy sauce, sesame oil, cream pear, Coca-Cola, if you want to know that secret. And because uh, it tenderizes it too, anything's carbonated, it tenderizes the meat really well. Um, but the problem is our kitchen, I didn't mention, we have no gas. That's one of the reasons why we got into New York Times the first time. We have no fire. We have an all electric um, kitchen and it's this big. And we turn out like 200 orders in about two hours out of that. Um, and when we first started serving the Calbee, we noticed that people weren't really loving it. And we weren't either too, because without the smoke and the fire, you don't get that flavor. So we nixed it from the menu since the very beginning. Because we, we just, it, we're not happy with it. And why would we serve something I'm not happy with? And I, I stand out there. And my big thing is, if I'm standing out there and you're asking me, how do you like it? And I hesitate, like, eh. That's a bad fucking answer. <laughs> I own the fucking place. So my, if you want to know my money, money, other my many rules, I love when people are like, well, is it good? Well, you know I'm the fucking owner, right? I don't fucking serve it. I don't fucking love it. I don't fucking love it. I don't fucking serve it. Then people ask me, what does that mean? I'm like, oh, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> I, don't, I, I fuck, 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 serve it. I love it. How about that? So, but it, it, it's... It, 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 that I can tell you right now, my wife, as you know, she doesn't consider herself a chef, but a lot of people do, and, and she is. She's the one that created all the food. That was her, like, that was almost a deal breaker when we, when we were about to open the restaurant. She's about to, like, no, I can't do this, because we have to make compromises when you're mass producing food. Um, and they're not always quality compromises as much as maybe, uh, maybe flavor profile compromises sometimes. And you know, it's also cost too, because like you can't use all the best ingredients in the world and you're trying to stay within $10. That's, and by the way, like fine dining, their margins tend to be lower than actual fast casual. So they may be spending more, but they might be making less. Because like if they lose, a they lose a reservation, they lose almost the entire margin sometimes. So it's, it's a tough business. I wouldn't recommend it unless you really love it. And like I worked in film, I do the same, I, I'd say the same thing. Don't do it unless you really, really, really love it. And, and not to say, I wouldn't say expect to fail as much as expect to come across hurdles and expect to just you know enjoy it as much as you can while you're there so yes in back how was your wife in, in doing the change from being a project manager to working as a chef I mean, what are her thoughts about that right now um what is, how does my wife feel in the change from being a project manager in advertising to being a chef i will say this my wife is um she's very uh She's very Asian in the sense that um, she never, like her, her family always wanted her to be like a nurse or a doctor or something like that, but they're not incredibly, they're not incredibly enthusiastic as much as they want to be careful, right? And like moving into this was not, is not a very careful move. And she's not incredibly, she, this is not her dream as much as this is her talent. Like I always feel like I'm her coach. And, I, and like when I say I had to coerce her, I'm actually not kidding about that. Like, you know, as, when I used to work at the agency in, in film, part of what you do at an agency is you have to figure out and recognize a talent in someone and pull it out of them, even if they don't know it. Um, I will say that my wife, in doing this for two and a half years, she's figured out she's not a very good day-to-day -day chef because uh, she's not a yeller or a screamer, but she doesn't like managing people day-to-day because -day it annoys the shit out of her. Um, but it's not even that. Like, it then, you know, when, it, when something's your baby and you see things, just little things getting messed up here and there, as a chef should always notice, it really annoys her. And it's not to say that those are bad, like some mistakes are forgivable. It's, it's like if, if the green onion moves from here to there, it's fine. But it does change things a little bit. And for her, all that compounded just frustrates her. 
Um, I, from become, being a project manager and moving to that, I think she likes being her own boss better. She doesn't, but she, I, I will say she's very risk averse. Like, you know, in not having consistent cash flow and paying everyone before we pay us, if not, sometimes not at all, that really stresses her. And she's, she's, she's conflicted about being her own boss and the inconsistent cash flow for the sake of possibly a larger payout. That, that is hard for, for me. I'm incredibly risk accepted. I kind of don't give a shit. I do give a shit about my wife. That's the only thing that will stress me out the most. You know, my staff and everything else, I'll figure it out. The minute my wife cracks on anything is when I just drop everything and try to figure it out. Because at the end of the day, she's my partner, you know, not only as in life, but in business. And if, if I'm losing her, I might be losing the business. So I have to juggle that. And that, that part's hard. I love working with her every day, but that is incredibly stressful for her. And you know, it's something that I, 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 I don't think she's ever, ever, ever dealt with this level of stress before. And it's been pretty eye-opening for her, so. Oh, and by the way, if anyone parked in the 10 a.m., like you want to make sure you don't get a ticket, and I don't want to be the reason for that. So, and no, there's street cleaning. Seriously, about yeah. Oh, okay, cool. I just want to make sure, like, if anyone. And uh, yeah, so thank you so much. Oh, that was great. <laughs>